All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all are doing well on this very special day. I am super honored to be here. Um, like Dr. Wilson said, I was trained um, at Vanderbilt University, but I've always felt um, a special connection to Michigan. I was never formally trained here, but I do know a lot of scholars that have come through here that have remained here, great people like Dr. Robert Taylor. So I um, consider Michigan, whether it considers me, um, a set, kind of a second home. So it's really exciting to be here. Um, also, as Dr. Wilson mentioned, I was trained as a sociologist, so I have a bit of a different perspective probably than some of the other um, panelists uh, that will speak with you. But um, I'm also housed in uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, so I'm I think the only one who's pretty out of town. Um, but so to date, my research has really sought to address ongoing questions related to links um, between multiple disadvantaged social statuses and health inequalities at different stages of the life course, right? And just to give you all a bit of um, an idea of how I arrived at these interests, a lot of it was personal. So I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Anyone from Baltimore, Maryland? Oh, DC, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, any kind of big city could probably relate to this, but um, I saw one side of Baltimore, right? So this is the, um, the aquarium, which is in the Inner Harbor that you visit on field trips. This is Camden Yards, where um, the Baltimore Orioles play baseball team. This is actually a picture of the uh, high school that I went to, Friends School of Baltimore, Quaker School. Um, this is one of the malls in the Inner Harbor, one of uh, um, our prestigious uh, markets that's located in a very affluent neighborhood. Um, these are one of the crab houses that people will frequent, right, to have some good crabs and seafood. So I grew up going to all of these types of things, right? But I also grew up with headlines like this, right, where Baltimore cities don't even have air conditioning for their students and having to close early because it's too hot for children to be there, right? I also would pass these types of homes going to my grandmother's house, right? They're dilapidated um, corner stores that uh, sold liquor and cigarettes that tended to be clustered in particular types of communities, um, unkempt, right, um, types of houses. This is actually um, a picture of the church that I went to growing up um, in Baltimore. Actually, it had to stop its uh, nighttime vigils because of the drug activity that was going on outside of the um, outside of the church halls, right? And so this was kind of a, a two-sided perspective that I had. And a lingering question um, for me as I was growing up was, why is this? Why, um, on the one hand, am I going to this very kind of elite school with technology and whatnot? Um, and my, I have friends who go to um, other schools that don't have paper to write on. Right. And so I eventually learned that all these differences in neighborhoods and schools and in churches that I was seeing um, culminated into very um, serious health risks, right, and um, that had significant um, consequences for one's quality of life. So what you're looking at here is um, kind of the health prospects of um, residents living in two um, different neighborhoods, one being Roland Park, which is a very affluent neighborhood where my school was located. In another neighborhood, which is maybe five or six miles away, um, uptown Drew Hill, um, Drew Heights, excuse me. Residents in Roland Park could expect to live to age 83 on average, whereas residents of Drew Heights um, could expect to live 20 years fewer, right? So an average age of 36. People who grew up in Druid Heights um, were three times more likely to have heart disease, eight times more likely to have diabetes, 15 times more likely to die by homicide, and 20 percent more, uh, excuse me, 20 times more likely to have um, HIV and AIDS, right? Again, these are communities that are five, ten minutes away from each other. And so then I went to grad school to pursue a doctorate in sociology, right? Because I was really interested in understanding these types of um, what I came to know as social determinants of health, right? Things like neighborhoods and schools. And so I was drawn to sociology because the field's emphasis on power and structure, right? So how these things really shape the conditions of our life um, that influence health and well-being, how these things shape our relationships, and interactions with one another, our opportunities, and our overall quality of life. And one of the first readings I remember doing in grad school that really stuck with me was Jay Pearson's Can't Buy Me Whiteness. Has anyone read this piece back in 2008? No? Okay, well, um, I'll give you a quick summary. So this, really, this article, I think, did a beautiful job of challenging um, the universal applicability of what has been and is still considered a very robust, strong um, relationship in the health literature, which is the relationship between socioeconomic status and health, right? 
And so he presents um, evidence showing that this relationship between socioeconomic um, status and health doesn't look the same for racial and ethnic minorities as it does for whites, right? And how um, this relationship shouldn't be something that's considered paradoxical, right? Which is what scholars would have argued, just saying, oh, it doesn't fit um, among racial and ethnic minorities, so something must be wrong with them, right? Not the actual relationship. But Jay Pearson goes on to argue that this weak relationship between SES and health for non-whites um, is really a result of historical legacies and contemporary factors um, that differentiate the meanings um, of traditional socioeconomic indicators like education and income. And so this was really something that resonated with me, right, coming from um, a background in which my family's middle class status looked very different um, and felt very different than um, those of my middle class white counterparts who I went to school with, right? And so from then on, I became really passionate about um, kind of unpacking and compl um, complicating, excuse me, these well-known relationships in the health literature um, to better understand the unique pathways to health among all kinds of social groups. So my research thus far, um, and most likely in the future, is kind of squarely situated within the literature on racial stratification and health, right? And in this literature, it's not uncommon to see that black-white disparities are often um, unexplained when controlling for things um, like socioeconomic status, health behaviors, as we saw from um, some of Dr. Bird's work, right? Kind of these well-known determinants of health. And so part of um, why we get these residual gaps, right, so these unexplained um, remaining gaps in health um, is because uh, most of our studies uh, for, most of our studies examining racial inequality have been comparative, right? So um, comparing one minority group to whites normally. And while this certainly gives us a lot of great information, um, this is what the bulk of our knowledge is based on, it undertakes, um, uh, a certain uh, type of assumption, right? And it gives us a certain type of information because what it's doing is that it's assuming that members of a similar racial group or gender group um, are impacted um, by social factors in an equivalent manner, right? And therefore experience the social world in the same way. Um, and that is an untenuous um, assumption. Right, and it also masks heterogeneity in health that exists among these broadly defined social groups, whether that be racial group, gender groups, um, and consequently that actually might obscure the full nature and extent of racial inequalities. And so my research to date, again, has taken two types of approaches to better understand um, this type of heterogeneity. Um, one approach has been to apply an intersectionality perspective to really understand the joint consequences of social statuses like race, ethnicity, skin color, gender, social class, to understand both these inter and intra um, group disparities along the set of um, important social characteristics. And then um, another line of my work has taken a more explicit within group approach um, to studying health equality um, among African Americans in particular uh, to uncover these unique pathways to health among um, this group. I'm going to go over a few of the findings from my research that I found particularly interesting. And so this first set of findings comes from that um, intersectionality approach. And so what we're going to see here are age trajectories of body mass index by the intersections of uh, race, ethnicity, and gender among white, black, and Hispanic men and women ages 13 to 31. And what we see is that for men, um, there's an expected relationship, right? So the solid white line is white men. This line with boxes um, is for black men, and then this line with diamond um, points is for Hispanic men. So black and Hispanic men tend to have higher BMIs across this early part of the life course than their white counterparts. Kind of no surprise there. What is interesting is that white women tend to have the most advantaged um, BMI trajectories across this age range. Black women have the worst uh, this, uh, trajectory across the age range. And uh, Latina women fall somewhere in between. And what's important to take away from this is it might be a little hard to see here, but there's actually larger racial and ethnic disparities among women than men. Um, black women and Hispanic women are particularly disadvantaged, as well as Hispanic men, right? And so blacks and Hispanics aren't, um, as a whole, uniformly disadvantaged, right? There's, there are quite a few differences. The same paper also um, looks at how wealth plays a role. And so what we're looking at here is how race, ethnicity, and wealth combine among men. And so for white men, we see what we would expect, right? So the wealthiest um, white men have the lowest uh, or the most advantaged BMI trajectory, right? And we see this gradient where the worst trajectory is among um, the, le the least wealthy white men. And we see the exact opposite for Hispanic men. So this line is actually for um, the wealthiest Hispanic men. 
they have the most disadvantaged BMI trajectory in early life. <clears throat> this is um, Hispanic men with kind of middle range um, wealth. And then this is uh, Hispanic men with the lowest levels of wealth who are actually exhibiting lower BMIs, healthier BMIs than their wealthier counterparts, right? And so across this age range of 13 to 31, wealthy Hispanic men actually experience a 12 point increase in their BMI compared to an eight point increase uh, among their white counterparts, an eight point increase among non-wealthy whites, right? And a seven point increase among um, non-wealthy Hispanic men going to be the same kind of um, trajectory plot, but up for among women, and we're going to be comparing white and black women. So for white women of all um, wealth levels, the results suggest that they follow a similar trajectory. Here's the line for wealthy black women, middle kind of uh, wealth levels of black women, and um, non-wealthy black women, right, who again are seeing um, the lowest levels or the most advantaged um, BMI trajectories, which is the exact opposite of what the social determinants literature would suggest, right? You think the more wealth that you would have, the better your health would be. And that is not what we're seeing at all for uh, minority women. So what, grow, what um, starts off as a three point difference in BMI between um, white and black women at age 13 grows to a nine point difference um, at age 31, which is young, right? Okay, um, so these next sets of findings are going to come from um, the more with it, the more explicit within group approach. So looking at African Americans um, in particular, using the Cardia study, uh, looking at BMI by skin color. And so what we see for light and medium skinned women, this is their BMI trajectory from the 30s to the 50s. For dark skinned women, it is much worse, right? For light skinned men, they experience um, a more advantaged BMI trajectory. For medium skinned men, an even better trajectory. And then dark skinned men are overlapping with light skinned men. And so, one way to think about these um, types of disparities is to um, look at age equivalent profiles. So, among women, for example, it takes about 23 years for a lighter skinned woman to have the BMI profile of um, a young dark skinned woman. Right, so said differently, uh, a 55 year old light skin or medium skin woman, woman, excuse me, has the BMI profile of a 32 year old dark skin woman. Okay. And so we see a similar gap, not as big, but a similar gap among men, where um, medium skin men actually have the BMI profile of their light and dark skin counterparts 13 years later. These next sets of findings are actually from a brand new project that I've been working on, um, both independently and with um, several collaborators. It's based on a grant that we were just awarded from NIH, um, looking at uh, mobility context, right? So um, how um, much the county that you grew up in allows for um, socioeconomic mobility. And this is kind of harping back to um, my interest uh, from the Pearson 2008 piece and seeing how these educational gradients by race um, or what they look like and if they depend on a particular type of context in which one was raised. So I know this is a lot going on in this slide. I'm going to walk you through it. But on the left, what we're looking at are two sets of um, results for whites and the outcome is cardiometabolic risk. So this is really a biological indicator of um, physiological aging, right? So higher levels are indicate poor health. And what we're seeing is for whites, no matter what kind of mobility context they grew up in, higher educated individuals always have um, health benefit, right? So they have lower levels of um, cardiometabolic risk. And the same thing holds for um, depressive symptoms. So at these um, both high, growing up in both high and low um, mobility context, college educated um, and whites experience fewer depressive symptoms. Be a bit of a different story for blacks, right, where it really does depend on the mobility context in which they were raised. So African Americans who grew up in these, um, in low mobility context, there's no significant educational gradient. So it doesn't matter that you've achieved um, a college education. And for Blacks who grew up in a high mobility context, those who um, go on to attain a college education do see some health benefit, right? But only in that particular context. For depressive symptoms, it's actually the exact opposite. So African-Americans who grew up in these high mobility places, there's no significant educational difference um, in young adulthood. But for African-Americans who grew up in these low mobility contexts, um, those who go on to attain a college degree actually experience um, a mental health benefit. 
And then the last uh, graph I'll show you is for Hispanics who kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Um, and so for their physical health, so their cardiometabolic risk, higher education is generally associated with better health, right, regardless of um, the mobility context. But for depressive symptoms, um, there really is only a um, mental health benefit of higher education among the low um, mobility, um, among individuals who grew up in low mobility context. Right? And so just to summarize that kind of wealth of findings, right? So for whites, the educational disparities are quite robust. Right? It doesn't matter what kind of context that they're growing up in, um, higher education is always linked to um, better outcomes. For Blacks and Hispanics, it depends on the context. So higher education among Blacks is associated with better physical health only among those who grew up in counties that facilitate mobility. Right? And the exact opposite is um, true when we're thinking about mental health. For Hispanics, higher education is generally associated with better physical health, but these results are actually driven by foreign-born Hispanics, right? So thinking about nativity processes. And so U.S.-born Hispanics actually follow a similar pattern to U.S.-born Blacks when thinking about these links between context and um, education and health. And the last set of findings that I'll show you um, comes from a project that uh, I actually presented here. It must have been last semester, um, looking at how different dimensions of race influence health disparities. And so um, what we're looking at is disparities in psychological distress. And so if we were to clump all African-Americans together, we would uh, conclude that blacks tend to have lower psychological distress than whites, right? When we disaggregate this by skin color, the groups that are only experiencing these lower levels of psychological distress are those rated as having dark or very dark brown skin. Right, so lighter skinned African Americans actually have comparable levels of psychological distress to whites. When we um, incorporate context into these types of patterns, so looking at the proportion of black residents in um, one's census tract, right, so for whites um, who grew up in high proportion black neighborhoods, they see a bit of a bump in their psychological distress, but um, the difference is um, negligible. Um, blacks who are rated as having medium skin. Um, medium brown skin actually see uh, a drastic decrease in psychological psychological distress in adulthood if they grew up in high proportion black neighborhoods. And then we see a similar story for um, African Americans rated as having dark brown skin. If we look at the flip side, so looking at how um, growing up at different levels of uh, proportion of white residents plays a, um, an influence. So for whites, the more um, residents that live in their census tract, the um, lower their psychological distress levels. For medium skin and dark skin African Americans, the pattern is the exact opposite, right? So at, uh, for those, for medium and dark skin African Americans who live um, in high proportion white neighborhoods, they're actually experiencing relatively high levels of psychological distress. Okay, so I'm going to end. I think I have about three minutes left for what um, my dream or dreams are for the social world moving forward. <clears throat> and these are kind of lofty, probably not as attainable <laughs> um, as I probably could have been, but um, we'll just go along with it. So my first dream is to um, really eliminate excess suffering among marginalized communities and groups, right? And so another striking fact that I learned during grad school that has really always stuck, stuck with me as well is the degree of um, excess mortality that exists, right? Or the deaths that could have been avoided, um, but and that could have been avoided by social factors, right? And so there was a study done back in 2004 that found if African Americans had the health of whites in the US, over 880,000 deaths could have been avoided, right? And we can compare that to about um, 177,000 deaths um, that were saved by medical advances. And so just to put this in another kind of perspective, David Williams actually compares this to, um, compares these excess deaths to a Boeing 767 plane, so a regular sized plane that you, I'm sure, have all <coughs> been on, um, being shot out of the sky and everyone on board um, dying, right? Um, and this occurring every day for a year and everyone on board is black. That's how many excess deaths that we're talking about. That is um, directly attributable to social determinants. Right, so there's a dire need to really address um, the social factors that are playing a role in these very stark health inequalities. So this leads me to my next point. Um, I really hope for equal access to quality of life, um, whether that be quality education or schools, quality neighborhoods, workplaces, but just giving everyone the same opportunity to, to have that healthy living 
And then um, my last point um, is that I hope that one day we do live in a world that's free from biases and their pathogenic effects. Right? So this is one thing that Dr. Martin Luther King explicitly preached, right? that people may be judged by, uh, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Right? And so we know that these judgments from the social statuses that we have or that we're um, ascribed and the treatments that result from these types of ju judgments are particularly toxic and can be deadly, right? especially from marginalized groups. So I hope that we do see a world one day where these kinds of biases are eradicated. Stop there, right at 20 minutes.